Our second lesson is a continuation from chapter 7, from the book of Revelation, verse 9, and then from 13 to the end. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, who stood before the Lamb and before the throne of God. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits upon the throne will dwell among them. And they neither shall hunger nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and will lead them to a fountain of living waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. The final lesson is taken from the work Apocalypse Revealed. Concerning the words from this verse, one of the elders answered and said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said, You know. These words signify a desire to know and the will of interrogating, and then the, and then the answer and information. The reason why John was questioned by the angel concerning these things, or the elder, is because it is very common in all divine worship that a a person should first will, desire, and pray. And then the Lord will answer, inform, and do. Otherwise, a person does not receive anything divine. Now, as John saw those who were arrayed in white robes, He was desirous to know and to ask where they were from. This was perceived in heaven, so then he was first asked, and then he was informed. The same occurs in the book Zechariah, and also many places in the Word, where frequently it is said that the person should call out and cry to the Lord. And also it is said that the Lord gives them what they should ask. The Lord gives us what we should ask. Therefore, it is also said that the Lord knows beforehand, but still wills that a person should ask, to the end that they may do it as if from themselves, and thus it may be appropriated to them. Otherwise, the petition is not really from the Lord, and if it weren't from the Lord, then the Lord could not respond by saying they should then receive what they have asked for. Amen. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Amen. The elder asked John. We know in the, this section of the word, the book of Revelation, John sees a number of elders in the throne room. Twenty-four elders in chapter 4 are mentioned. These elders in various part, chapters of the book of Revelation appear doing various things and other angels appear. The book of Revelation, we're told, could not be understood in its literal sense without the revelation that has been given concerning its interior meaning, its internal sense. Otherwise, people will look at it and see it as a political, historical statement about nations rising up against nations, and when certain things happen on the earth, they're interpreted as another sign that the apocalypse is going to take place. And throughout the years, literally looking at this book, people have been counting the years. Is it a thousand years now? Something's going to happen after a thousand years. Is it 1,556 days? Something's going to happen. There are so many numbers mentioned, so many stages mentioned, so many amounts of people. Some, like the 144,000 sealed, have been interpreted to mean that for some reason God only wants a certain number of people and in the book of Revelation here in this chapter 
they're of the children of Israel. So we could interpret that all the rest of us who do not have any Jewish descent are not destined for heaven. But with an understanding given to us by the second coming, the teachings of the new church, we're told to not look at person and not look at place when we are reading the word, but to see the word as a statement concerning developmental stages, which may look like history, and in fact, history does develop along stages, but our own personal spiritual development is not time-bound nor place-bound. You may not mature to be a, being a grown adult until you're 25 or 28 or 30. Or you may, in fact, mature much earlier. How do you measure that? We can't look at the Word in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, or in the writings of the New Church and literally take the numbers, the years, the days, the things that have to do with place and time, and think somehow the Lord's giving us a message about this place or that time, or this nation or those people. Who are those arrayed arrayed in white, and where do they come from? The elder asked John this, and they said because in heaven it's perceived. When you're in inquiring about something in the spiritual world, the people around you who are wise, they can see it on your faces. They can see it in your manner. They can see that you're eager to learn and to do the Lord's will, or that perhaps you aren't. So in the interior sense, when the elder says to John, who are these and where do they come from, it's because John himself was given to desire to know the answer. There is a saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Oh, so much truth is in that concept. The Lord gives us to perceive and see and then develops us to be able to receive from the teachers that are around us. When our stage is ready, the Lord will give us the ability to understand according to our ability to receive. And no more and no less. Many of us who are in teaching in various ways, and all of us to a certain extent, have to help instruct people around us. If you want something done, probably have to instruct the person that you'd like to help you what to do. And if you're a professional teacher, you know that you can't give more, more instruction about something than the person's capable of receiving. And lots of times when you think you've done a fine job teaching, you find out later on it went right over their heads. Or you look back at your own life and you think, you know, the Lord was trying to give me a message. Trying and trying and trying. I finally got it. But you look back and think, the Lord put people in my life or brought me to places where situations were taking place where I could have learned and yet it took a long time to actually get Get the message or understand the lesson. We're fortunate in the new church that we have a number of books or pages of revelation to explain different sections of the Old Testament or the New Testament. And sometimes in the writings they're explaining themselves. The apocalypse, which the word itself has has been used so often in modern times to present something horrible with no redemptive value. The Apocalypse is a book of revealing. That's what Apocalypse means in Greek. It's revelation. Something that's apocalyptic, though, in modern times means it's, it's, it's horrible. Things are going to go and, and never recover. The book of the Apocalypse is about recovery. It's about the stages that we need to go through, each of us individually, to help us have the things within us judged, to help us be given new truth which will make us make a decision, which way do we want to go, how do we want to respond, and hopefully continually face the dragons, 
face Babylon, face the allurements of the world, that will then bring us closer to the Lord. There's no entering heaven simply by getting a seal upon your forehead or the sign of the cross from the waters of baptism. There is a struggle because within each one of us, we have a tendency and a desire to make ourselves the most important person on earth and our possessions and the gathering of them the most important thing happening in the world. And we need to learn and unlearn. We need to learn that that's not what we're here for. And we need to unlearn the things that we would innately desire. That is, taking care of number one. There's a good use for taking care of number one, but we're told when things are in order, a person should provide for themselves and for their family those things that would allow them then to be of greater use to others and not flip it around to have other people provide everything for me and my family and my people so that I'm happy no matter how the rest of the world is. Not thinking from time and place. How do we do that? It's a developmental stage that we must come into to make spiritual progress. I'm going to read one of the other books. The lesson was from Apocalypse Revealed, the published book concerning the book of Revelation. The Apocalypse Explained is a longer set of volumes that also talk about the book of Revelation. In the Apocalypse Explained, we find these words concerning this verse where the elder asks John, who are these arrayed in white and where do they come from? And John says, you tell me. These clothed in white robes, who are they and where have they come from? This signifies respecting now those who are in truth and who are protected by the Lord. What quality they are. They're in white robes to represent the truths the Lord has given to them. And where do they come from? Now, shift from being in church in Toronto, Ontario, to try to be in heaven, in your mind's eye. Try to take yourself into the spiritual world. Try to think the way an angel would think. If I approached you now in the spiritual world and said, where do those people come from? Look at those people. They're wearing white robes. Where do they come from? If you're in the spiritual world, you don't care about person or where somebody's from. When you're in the spiritual world, you care about what is in the person, the essence flowing down into the person, and not where a person is from, who's their family, where were they born, how much money did their family have, are they well-educated, do they have good status? Are they considered politically correct? Angels don't ask those questions for one reason. They don't need to. If you're angelic and you look at another person, ask the angelic questions. What do you love? What do you care for? I care not how old you are or what your family or country of origin is what your paycheck reveals. I care about what you love and how I can support you. That's an angelic thought. So continuing in the Apocalypse Explained number 472, it says, because angels in the spiritual world, when they see and meet others, they never inquire who they are and where they come from, but what is their quality? And so in their spiritual idea, that's what the angel is asking. When the elder said, who are these and where do they come from? In a spiritual idea, it's, what do you love and what is your quality? Angels only inquire into the quality of those they see, just the quality. They don't inquire about their dwelling place. In the spiritual world, they know everyone is given a dwelling place according to their spiritual quality. Not the other way around. And how often we can look at someone and see where they live or where they come from or what they're wearing or what they're driving and we'll make decisions about how we're going to relate to them because of those external appearances. Those 
are not the genuine qualities of anyone, as we know. They're simply external appearances. And angels see right past that. And coming to the new church to worship and inquire of the Lord to be a better person is to try to think this way ourselves. To don't, not to say, those people. Who are those people? But to inquire about, what can I do to make their quality of life better? That's our angelic response to those people. Because it says, asking who are those people involves person. And where do they come from involves place. And in the spiritual world, there is no thought concerning thinking from person or from place. The Lord always is working to get us to ask the right kind of questions. As a matter of fact, all of our development in religious or spiritual life might be seen as a quest and responding to the best questions the Lord's giving us. And as we make spiritual progress, the Lord brings us into new places where we see new things and begin asking new questions. When you said, O Lord, seek my face, my heart said, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So we hear in the Psalms. What are the questions that you're asking of yourself and that you're asking of the Lord. What are those questions? There are a number of ways you can hone in on good questions. Coming to church is a wonderful way to stop and pause, put the world of time and place aside, although we can never leave it totally, and come into the presence of the Lord. Sing praises to him, hear his words, hear an interpretation or a sermon about his teachings, and reflect upon it. Hopefully, it's not so abstract that you think, how could I possibly make this of something of my life? And yet, to be angelic means to abstract the way we're thinking from time and place and person so the Lord wants us to think from principle, from true things, from good things, from those qualities as they flow out of heaven from the Lord into our minds and hearts. And it says he will always give you to ask the next right question and do the next right thing. He will always present that to you, no matter what circumstance you're in, no matter who you're around, no matter how much suffering or joy might be involved with any one state of life that we're in, the Lord will give us to ask, what is the best thing for me now to do? Whether it is to remain quiet or whether it is to become active. Whether it is to respond to somebody with a certain emotion or not respond at all. Whether it is to ask someone what you can do for them, or whether you can ask them if they can help you. In the book of Revelation, John, as the central figure in terms of the writer or the voice, is brought by the Lord to see a vision of a developmental and very complex historical event which is encapsulated in each one of your individual lives. We all must have the Lord's Word be in our hearts, revealing to us our next right thing to do. When we look at the external circumstances of our life, we can't totally abstract person and place from it. But we have to see enough of principle and have our hearts guided by the ideas the Lord wants us to understand and love that are his gift from us, his gift to us. Many sheep have I, Jesus said, other than these, referring to the disciples, them too I must gather. 
The book of Revelation is a book that's written for us to have a comprehension concerning the end times, not of the natural world, but the end times of various states for various people who had taken the teachings of the church and had twisted and perverted them. The twisting and perversion of the idea that just believing in Jesus will save you, just this one thing, is, we're told, encapsulated in the idea of the dragon, a, fly, a fiery flying serpent that arises up from natural understanding of the word to look as if it has all the answers. So powerful. Yes, we must believe in Jesus. And in various ways, anybody who is a Christian will say, I believe in Jesus and that belief has saved me. Because genuine and true belief is living what we're thinking. Doing what is of faith. So there is a constant marriage of faith and doing or charity. And without those two coming together, there is no salvation. The other world is filled with people who believe, but they really don't want to be around the angels who do. And so the book of Revelation is a lesson to us about truly believing and doing. And also the other great protagonist in the book of Revelation is said to be Babylon. The cry of the world and our natural senses to make the natural world and a belief simply in natural things a trust and a longing and a desire for status, honor, reputation, and glory. To have those things be more important. Babylon was taken from the Tower of Babel, lifting ourselves up by a natural ramping to think that now we're above all else because we have these things. What's apocalyptic about the book of Apocalypse? is that the dragon and Babylon are destroyed. And you and I get to see the victory that the Lord performed. The woman clothed with the sun, the man-child that said with a rod of iron, and the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending from heaven, from God, out of heaven, in which we are invited to come and dwell. It's a story not of the end of the earth, the apocalyptic end, but the end of a stage of life so that a new life can be given. And this church, the church of the New Jerusalem, from chapters 20 and 21 of Revelation, is the church of the apocalypse. The Lord has blessed us with this knowledge and asked us to daily turn to Him and follow Him and be assured then that He will give us what we need, what to ask, what to will, what to desire, so that He will inform and help us to do those things of his will. To enter into the streets of gold and to wear the crown that he gives us. Amen.